Hello everyone and welcome back to my career mode let's play slash tutorial in Kerbal Space Program 1.4.3 and in this episode we're going to talk about interplanetary transfers and while in Kerbal Alarm Clock we have a Moho and Jewel opportunity first I'm gonna go with the one that probably should go for first which is Duna and so I'm gonna cancel these and we'll talk about how Kerbal Alarm Clock comes up with uh, these but uh, the first thing first uh, if you want to find out when to transfer to another planet and uh, that you, you don't know how to calculate that by hand, which is all right, uh, you can just use Kerbal Alarm Clock and it'll have a transfer when add new alarm, click transfer window alarm, and make sure the parent is the sun, change the origin to Kerbin, and then pick your de uh, wanted destination. So um, here, interestingly enough, we get a different result for a Duna alarm. Uh, you'll see that it has phase angle current and phase angle target. Phase angle target means this is the angle between Kerbin and Duna that we want. And this phase angle current is what we have right now. And basically, Kerbin is catching up with Duna. Because Duna is on the outer orbit, it's going slower. And right now, the angle between them is very high. But because Kerbin is going to be catching up, it's going to go down and eventually we're going to hit this in 94 days, it says. So I'm going to add that alarm. Why is there a discrepancy? Well, uh, the, the transfer window is sort of an area. It's not like exactly that time. So basically, if you go around, you know, plus or minus a few days, it'll be fine. Uh, especially with the Kerbal system, the transfer windows have a lot of leeway. Uh, in real life, the transfer windows are a little bit tighter, but... It with, especially with something like Jupiter, it can be really wide, like a month. So it's not too bad. But And it depends on exactly what you want to do when you arrive there. But yeah, so that is our transfer window that we're going to try and hit. And let's look at our rocket. Now, you might expect that to try and hit another planet, it's going to take a lot of delta V, but this is not so. To reach Duna, it'll only take about... 200 meters per second or so more than it takes to get to either the moon or Mimas. Uh, so really the delta V requirement is very low. The main obstacles to getting to another planet in Kerbal Space Program are communications and timing. Timing, we've got this alarm clock to help us and I'll show you how to estimate when the right timing is without that in case you don't want to use Kerbal Alarm Clock. And of course communications we unlocked last time Let's take a look at our probe here, and you can see the rocket is not really that big. I haven't tried it out. I think it'll work, but I'm not sure. But this is our probe, and I'll talk about the fairings in a sec. Hold on. Uh, but I've definitely not taken any chances on communication. I've got this relay antenna, and I've got four of these. And these, um, they're, they're direct. So the relay antenna is, is a relay, but these are direct. And so the relay would uh, communicate with a ground station at a distance of um, 10 gigameters from uh, with the level 2 DSN, which is what we have right now, but eventually 22.4. And then supplemented by these commutrons, which are direct. And these combined can go 40 gigameters. I suppose we can combine it with this one as well for 50 gigameters, which would definitely cover Duna in all situations. I don't know if, uh, I mean, if something is going to relay through this, I don't know if these other dishes count, but we'll see. Uh, that's a question mark. It's carrying some science, but it's mainly going to make orbit around Duna and help us with communications in the future. And we've got the barometer, thermometer, and two group containers, and then a one kilonewton thruster at the ant engine. It's not really one kilonewtons. It's, uh, it's actually two. Um, right there and that gives us 1422 meters per second and the rocket is like that remember on the decoupler uh, on the fairing pieces to add a decoupler otherwise your probe will be stuck to the fairing piece and gotta retract these in tonight you can see it's neatly tucked in there we don't have better solar panels so I've got a cubic octagonal strut here and that's uh, this structural part here and I've put the solar panels like that on there. Now remember at Duna, it's further away from the sun and you need double the amount of solar panels to get the same amount of power. Really, we, we don't expect to have a huge power problem with this, but uh, just in case, you know, I should add more batteries to be honest. 
I think it would be prudent to, because of the science and all, we, we always lack battery power. So I, I've added one battery here, but I'll add a bunch more. There's no point uh, taking any risks here. I'll tuck it in, and you can see the antennae. Well, I mean, we don't have to tuck it in that much. I want to make sure everything looks right. You can see I've carefully placed the antennae so they don't clip in with the solar panels. And the goo containers fit just right there. Okay. So we've got bonus batteries. Batteries are not that expensive anyway. Um, here we have a spark engine. Now, building fairings. So let me delete this fairing. Build fairing. Uh, you pl place it as far as it'll go. Click. And then... Um, well, it doesn't really uh, clip the dish. If I put one, like, I can make it even look better than I had before. So you just build it by clicking the segments like that. Here is a fairing that's meant to be an interstage fairing. And so what we do is we say build fairing. And we try and get it so that the place cross-section thing turns blue. So it says close fairing. But it gives me this jagged edge, but I can't do too much about that right now. Um, as far as I can tell, it'll always give me that little jagged edge there. So I'll just take it, but I just wanted to cover that up because it looks awkward. It's just for looks. It looks, I mean, it has no net benefit other than looks. It's just to cover up the fact that that looks awkward because it's a small engine, the spark engine. But that spark engine does give us, oh, this is set to Tylo. That's a bit of a problem. Okay, uh, 0.8 thrust weight ratio. Come to think of it, this might be a little bit too... Oh, I was looking at Tylo because of a totally different mission in a totally different situation. That's not good. Okay, uh, this is a little bit better to get off the launch pad. And yeah, uh, my expectation is that we can use uh, a little bit of the fuel from the spark stage and then a bit of fuel from the probe to actually make the transfer to Duna. I'm expecting the transfer to Duna to cost about 1,100 meters per second. So if you figure 4,000 to get into orbit, that's going to take 800 or so from this. That'll leave 700. So 700 from the spark stage plus, um, let's say, 500 from the probe stage. That leaves us an additional amount to make orbit around Duna. Okay, it does take more to make orbit around Duna than it takes around the moon or Minmus. So we have to take that into consideration. Let's go into the R&D building so I can show you which technology I unlocked for the fairings. And then, let me just make sure staging is correct. And then we'll go to the tracking station and talk about phase angles. So for R&D, uh, it is advanced construction uh, that has the Airstream protective shell, 1.25 meters. That's the fairings that we unlocked. Also, you get the other nose cones and stuff, and also the uh, slightly larger fairing pieces. Also, structural tubes, which are handy sometimes, and engine plates. I really wish there was an engine plate that was 1.25 meters, though. They have engine plates for all the other sizes, but not 1.25 meters. And I find it curious that they all get placed here when we don't even get you know, maybe they should put like specialized construction one, some of the big ones, because we only get the 2.5 meter fairing here, but somehow we get a 2.5 meter engine plate here, and also the 3.75 meter and 5 meter, so which I don't need right now. I mean, it's not gonna be for a long time. So one thing I would like is an engine plate that's 1.25 meter, and another thing is that um, I think they should probably should be in a different location, but we'll leave that be for now. Uh, we've got advanced construction, and that unlocked with uh, 90 science. Now in the tracking station, let's see how this all works out. So here's Kerbin. The logic behind the whole transfer window thing, when you should go from one planet to another, is that it, if, yeah, if I tried to go straight to Duna right now, let's say you launched a rocket and pointed right at it, it have the same result as launching a rocket and trying to point directly at the moon. In other words, by the time you got to the orbit uh, over the level of the target, the moon would have moved on. So you've gone to the wrong place. And same with Duna. Duna would have moved on by the time you got there, and you'd be in the wrong place. So that's the first thing. Second thing, when we uh, phased with the moon, 
uh, we were handling it in Kerbin orbit, right? The moon goes around Kerbin, and we go around Kerbin, and we waited for the right time around Kerbin. But in this case, Kerbin is sort of our spaceship right now, and we're going around the sun, and Duna's going around the sun. So the timing is where Kerbin is around the sun. Now, the ideal transfer window is calculated based on making sure that your trajectory out goes along with the momentum of Kerbin, which means in this direction, and that you arrive when you're going to be going along with the momentum of Duna, which is going to be in this direction. So we're going to try and make an arc like this, so that we hit Duna over here. Now, this is not the right time for that. The right time for that is in 94 days. That is known as a Hohmann transfer. It is the lowest energy transfer except for certain special conditions. Uh, but pretty much, for the most part, uh, anytime you want to do something here, you're probably going to be doing a Hohmann transfer of some kind, which means uh, 180 degrees around the central gravi gravitational body. So just going around like that. There are caveats uh, when it comes to inclination and all, but as far as inclination goes, Kerbin and Duna are basically in line, so no big deal there. So it's a simple calculation. Duna is a little bit lopsided around the sun, but that's not going to have a big difference. So let's take a look at what's going on in 94 days. Joule, uh, and the angle we're looking for, like Kerbin alarm clock said, is basically 45 degrees. And what that means is it's uh, the angle if the sun is in the center and Kerbin is at on the x-axis let's say it's the angle like this in this corner right here between Duna and Kerbin so if the sun is at what we call 9 o'clock and uh, you take the angle between Kerbin and your target it's the angle right around here so right now it looks like it's about 80 degrees and Kerbin is going to speed up and catch up to Duna and then we want a 45 degree angle between them. This angle is different for each of the planets. Joule, we want a 90 degree angle. It's actually 96. Elu, it's more than 100. And you can see the numbers here if you want to. So if we want to go transfer window, uh, Kerbin to Moho, it's supposed to be 108 degrees. Kerbin to Eve, negative 54. So Eve actually has to be behind us. So if Kerbin is here, we would want Eve to be over here. Right now would be a bad time. Eve is in front of us and about 80 degrees, but we want it negative 54, which is behind us. Or uh, you could also say that as 306 degrees because th that would be the whole way around. Um, Duna, 44, about 45. Uh, Drez, which is this plant right here that doesn't get much love, is 82 degrees is where we need it, so it needs to be ahead. And then Jewel, 96 degrees and ELU 101 degrees. Okay, and that's just based on the relationship between Kerbin's orbit, how long it takes for it to go around, versus how long it takes for the other ones to go around. Uh, because we're just trying to do a curve that's 180 degrees around the Sun. Now, the ones that are easier to get to are Eve and Duna, and that is not actually because they're closer specifically, but because of the gap between Kerbin's velocity, which is currently 9,284, uh, 9, and their velocity. So Eve is 1,127, uh, Duna 7,294. So to get to Duna and to make orbit around Duna, I just roughly, uh, th there's a better way of calculating this, but I'd roughly guess that it's going to be take about 2,000, which is the difference between um, Kerbin's velocity and Duna's velocity. And by the same token, the difference between Kerbin's velocity and E's velocity makes me estimate about 1,800. Um, so that's just a rough guesstimate based on the information you got here without doing any special calculations, just simple subtraction, right? Bigger number minus smaller number. Uh, so Moho is going to be tough to get to, right? Because Moho is going 13,661. And in fact, it's gonna take a lot more than this suggests to actually get into orbit around Moho uh, because it's not at its fastest point. This is its fastest point when it's really close to the sun. 
So there's that, and also it's got an inclination. So that also complicates things. But anyway, um, we'll we can just uh, estimate actively exactly how much it's going to take to get to Joule. Uh, even though there's this huge gap between Kerbin's orbit orbital velocity and Joule's orbital velocity, you can see about five thousand ish. Um, you don't have to worry about that too much because uh, the transfer is only going to take about 2,000 meters per second to get to Joule and Joule's influence is so great and its moons are so wonderful that they will help you get into orbit and in some later episodes I'm going to tell you how to use Joule's moons to help you get into orbit so you don't have to do it all manually but um, yeah, it'll help you out on that Elu's a different story <laughs> Elu's a bit of a different story but um, but uh, let me emphasize that this is not an exact number. This is the difference between uh, this velocity and that velocity. It's only like a first order approximation. It's like a guesstimate based on available data. It is not how you're supposed to calculate it. Okay. Um, if you want to find the actual number, there are delta V maps online. And so you'll just type into Google KSB delta V map. And that will give you a nice little map of exactly how much delta V in ideal conditions it takes to transfer from one planet to another. Now, for the most part, ideal conditions do hold in the Kerbin system. The exceptions are Drez here, Elu, and Moho. Um, those are not going to adhere very well to the ideal conditions because they have inclination. In the real solar system, lots of stuff has inclinations. And so a d simple delta V map of the real solar system really doesn't do very well. Uh, so anyway, but that's uh, that's later. Okay, so let's time warp. And I'll get rid of this right now. We don't need this for now. And we'll just get to that Dunar transfer window. And again, overall, it's not a whole lot more than just getting to the moon or Minmus when you think about it. And even to get to Joule 2000, that's a fairly reasonable amount to put onto your spacecraft. So you shouldn't be uh, reluctant to do interplanetary missions. Um, the, the three exceptions, the Moho, Drez, and Elu, are a bit more difficult. So that's that's the only caveat there. So now we're really close to that window, but again, there's some leeway. But we'll take a look at launching now. Okay, we don't need to do anything special on launch. We don't need to do any special timing in this case. SAS on, throttle is up, and launch. Launching in daylight might be marginally better, but it's not a big deal. We've got good ambient light here right now. And you can see sort of on the back on the of the envelope uh, estimation I said I wanted 2,000 meters per second to get, into, get to Duna and to get into orbit. And basically we've got 6,000 meters per second on this rocket. Oh, and I'm turning it way too fast and this is not going to be good. Uh, the thrust weight ratio is so low. We'll see if it can hold it. Okay, it looks good. There are way more sophisticated ways to estimate the delta V required to get from one planet to another available for KSP. Uh, one is called Transfer Window Planner and it will give you pretty much the exact thing that you need for any given transfer and account for the inclination properly. So if you want something that's better than a delta V map, Transfer Window Planner is probably the thing to go for. I'm going to just cut it right there. We'll coast. Now, you might wonder, well, instead of timing it like this, you know, waiting for Kerbin to get into the right position, uh, why don't we just launch a probe into solar space, you know, or um, around Kerbal, around the sun. First, go to escape velocity, escape Kerbin's influence, and then transfer to Duna. Well, you'll still have to wait. You'll still have to wait for the same phase angle to get to Duna. Uh, the downside is that, remember, prograde and retrograde burns are better when you are close to a gravitational body. Now you might think, well, the sun is a gravitational body and we'll be around it, but even around Kerbin we're the same distance away from the sun, so that's not going to make any difference, especially since we're going to be going with the momentum of Kerbin. Uh, so 
being around Kerbin itself is going to be a bonus. And that's important. So that's why we're doing it with Kerbin instead of uh, trying to get to escape first and then transferring separately. There will be a benefit to doing it this way. Okay, separation and ignition of the upper stage. And we can separate the fairings now as well. And since we're in space, let me extend these antennae before I forget. And also, don't forget to put your probe into auto-hibernate. With our communication here, we shouldn't lose communication. We should definitely be in communication with the geosynchronous or geosynchronous satellites. Okay, that's good enough. That will be orbit. Now, when do you actually plot your transfer? Well, remember that we want to go with the momentum of Kerbin, so we take advantage of Kerbin's momentum uh, around the sun. We don't want to go askew. That'll cost more. See, if you go off in this direction over here, uh, you could hit Duna. It's just going to cost more because you're only taking advantage of part of Kerbin's momentum there, and you're going to have to supply the the difference on your own. Now, do probes actually do go askew sometimes? Yes. And the reason for that is timing. So if it turns out that you're not right at the transfer window or you want to hit uh, Duna in a particular uh, or any planet at a particular place because it'll help the inclination situation, for instance, then you might want to go away from the momentum of the planet. It's not ideal, but you might have to to help your inclination situation. And so we expect, assuming our timing for the transfer is correct, that our outward bound trajectory is going to be in line with the trajectory of Kerbin. And we also expect that the delta V that's going to be required is about 1,100. So here um, we can see the purple line is going to be our trajectory out. And we're a little bit askew here, so that's not ideal, but let's take a look at what's happening. Uh, that's our outward bound journey. And you can see what we're providing is just the gap between Kerbin's existing trajectory and what ends up there. And that's a very small gap, really. And that's why it's only going to cost a little bit more than the escape velocity. We set Duna as a target. And we can see there's a descending node there. And we've got a close approach forming right there. We wanted to arrive here. So that's not the best thing. Let's fine tune it using this because uh, trying to pull these handles, I mean, certainly possible, but oh, that's getting closer to where we want it to be. Remember, uh, you could hit it over there, and let's, let me just plot that for you. Remember, uh, if you want to get there faster, that entails moving this trajectory off of uh, the straight line out of Kerbin. So if we move it this way, that changes the timing. And actually, that's further away, so we actually want to move it in the other direction, inward. So I'm going to tug that. And you don't have to do it with this handle. You can just use Maneuver Node Editor and Shift Time here. On these interplanetary burns, you never have to do a radial component. You may sometimes need a normal component to fix some inclination thing, but you don't need a radial component because the radial component is the same as shifting time. So if I shift time here, add, add, see, I've hit Duna right there. But that's not where I wanted to hit Duna. And the reason I don't want to hit Duna there is because, you see, when I arrive, there's going to be a gap between my trajectory. My trajectory is going out this way, but Duna is going this, uh, following its line. And that means I'm not going to be falling along with it, which means it's going to take more delta V to slow down. So I don't want to shift time at all. Um, what I want to do is reduce my orbit so that I only touch Duna's orbit at one point. See now this it'll take less effort to get into orbit around Duna but let's do more of that. So again I'm moving where my node is going to be in order to avoid any radial thing and there we lose it so that's about the best I can do. And let's It'll have to be two to second here. Well, actually, uh, one other way. Oops, I lost the target. One other way to manage this is you see, there's still a 0.1 degree difference. Well, we can use the normal, like I said, that can 
have an effect here. This might be useful. And you can see the uses, I'm pushing that encounter over there instead of where there's going to be a gap. And so that's going to be helpful. Now, did that make me spend a whole lot more delta V? Even though it says 137 meters per second, because the prograde vector is so much more, it only adds another 9 meters per second here. And that has to do with vector math, which I'm not going to teach you right now. So now we just need to fine tune. And we can right click on the closest approach. And we can see that's worse. That's about going to be like that. And then. I think the timing's off. Yeah. You can see the timing. Again, the timing is the same as a radial burn in this case. Improves. And this is improving that. We just try and get the number as low as possible. And there it shows an actual encounter. If we click on Duna and say focus view, we can actually see the encounter once we have one. And then we can make a more informed decision about exactly what I want to do here. Now I'm adding that, but this also has an effect. So you can decide which which of these has more influence. In other words, more bang for your delta V, right? How uh, does adjusting prograde improve the situation more, or does adjusting normal vector improve your situation more? See, this is this is going up and down now. That's not what I want. This is also going up and down. Well, that means shifting time is what I want. See just three numbers and then we adjust them. I would like it to be in line with Ike actually and we want to be going around prograde which means counterclockwise so that we're going the same direction as Ike just in case I want to send this probe to Ike to do some signs. This goes past but you notice I'm playing around with one second shifts so you're probably going to have to make a correction yeah you should just go for it and then fine tune it halfway there. Make course adjustment. This is a reasonable distance. If you can get to within 10,000 kilometers, you can, you have a reasonable chance of doing a, and that's for Duna specifically. For Jewel, you can get much further away. For doing a make course adjustment here and this maneuver node editor you can shift to maneuver node 2 and here you'll probably find that um, it's going to be easier to move it about it'll cost a little bit more but we've got 2400 left and the initial burns only gonna cost 148 and it's just see now it's nicer to move it about very clear about where it's going and you can get arbitrarily close to Duna however you like. Now Duna has an atmosphere. We don't want to encounter its atmosphere. It says here that its atmosphere starts at 50 kilometers. If you have a heat shield and you want to use its atmosphere to capture, that's an option. So if you do want to dip into the atmosphere, you'll have to figure out what atmospheric height will be safe to capture. But Duna's atmosphere can capture you just like Kerbin's atmosphere slows you down on, on descent. Now, you want uh, the thing is you have to decide whether you want to ultimately land on Duna, in which case, you know, you can head pretty low into the atmosphere of Duna to just go straight for landing. Or if you just want to be captured into orbit around Duna, you have to be a little bit more careful. But we'll get to that some other time. That's more than just a transfer. So this is the mid course adjustment. It's just gonna cost about twenty meters per second or so, and it'll get us to where I want to go. If I, I can plot right now, add maneuver, how much it's going to take to get to orbit. And I'll be about 600, so we have that. Now, if it turns out that you can't plot that far ahead, that's a setting. Um, I don't know if it's here or here. It's conic patch limit here. Put that to 7, otherwise you're not going to be able to plot that far ahead. If it's on 3, you can only plot 3 steps ahead. Uh, so this allows you to plot seven steps ahead. So that's important. 
especially with interplanetary stuff. Not so important for the Moon or Minmus, though it could be fun. Okay, so we've got our node uh, in 12 minutes. Timing is very important for these interplanetary transfers, much more so than for the Moon and Minmus. The timing for when you're, you've got your window, that's a little bit fudgeable. But the timing for when you're actually starting your burn and trying to get there is touchy, right? We've been shifting it by one second this way and that in order to make sure that we get the right encounter. And so if we take a look at the Delta V stats here, uh, it looks like this stage can almost finish this burn just on its own. 1 minute and 24 seconds. So we can time warp to pretty close to the maneuver node to start this. And we'll just need a little bit from the 2 kilometer, uh, two kilonewton thrust or deant engine. Of course, if you do have MechJeb, you can have it execute the node, but that's only advisable if it's on just the one stage. Maybe we'll see what it does. Right, if it has to do a major staging in the middle, like half the burn is with one and half the burn is with the other, it might not calculate that right, I'm not sure. So right now I'll, I'll give it control. Normally, uh, just off the top of my head, I know that because it's going to get lighter and lighter, uh, more of the burn has to be done before the node than after as far as time is concerned. What we want is half the delta V to be done before and half after, but it takes more time to burn the first half of the delta V. So I probably start out like um, 40 seconds would be half, 42 seconds. So I probably start out like 50 seconds. It's going to start out. Well, it started out 44 seconds, so I would have been a little bit early. We will do many more interplanetary transfers and talk about the peculiarities of different... Okay, so it's going to be weird about it, isn't it? Okay, let me abort that. Okay, so let's finish this set mission. And as we're getting close to the end of the burn, we really need to take a look at exactly what's happening. You can see it's getting close. Let me even throttle down this. Make sure, actually, turn to SAS so it doesn't wander with the node. And I'm actually going to get rid of this plot. Oh, and, and that plot. Just point prograde for me, please. And I want to see when we get the encounter. You see, it's getting closer, closer, closer. Up, ah, there's an encounter. Now we can focus view. Once there is an encounter, we can focus the view and we just keep burning until it's at its closest. Well, in this case, I don't even know if we need a mid-course adjustment. I've gotten rid of the mid-course adjustment plot and I mean, I guess just to show a mid-course adjustment, we'll we'll do one, but and we'll do it to level it out and make sure it's equatorial and everything. Communication satellites could be, you know, in a tilted orbit too. We're not trying to put a Keo stationary or Duna stationary satellite there. But here, I'm going to adjust this, and we'll use the little handles here. I'm just gonna, oh, see, it's a little bit touchy. So remember, you can use the scroll wheel to fine tune it if you're just trying to use this instead of trying to use MechJeb. And so scroll wheel down. Okay, but see, now we're we're equatorial mostly, let's get that right, but we're crashing into Duna. That's not good. So, we're going to use prograde retrograde to pull away. Remember, the one time you do a radial burn is when you're entering the SOI, doing a radial burn will pull you closer or away from from the target, what you're trying to make orbit around. So if you wanted to get closer away from Duna here, you should do a you should do a burn here and fine tune that. You can see why you might want to fine tune it. This mid course adjustment that we've got turning our orbit from that to that 
is only going to take 0.2 meters per second. So it's not exact. I mean, it's it's good. It's possible that you're only going you're going to have a gap of like a hundred kilometers from what you want, and you might want to touch that up once you get in here. But anyway, let's uh, check on the whole charge situation, communication situation on the way. We'll follow this along. I'm not gonna do any other mission at the same time. We will try and complete this, get this into orbit around Duna. Make sure I haven't messed anything up, which is always possible. So far so good on power. Remember the orientation of the spacecraft may be important for the whole solar power thing, so we, we're gonna have to watch out for that. Adding extra batteries gives us a little bit of a buffer time to make sure that we have time to fix things if necessary. So out it goes on escape. And now we are around the sun. We could do some science here. I think we can do some science here. Let's try that. Barometer. Uh, transmits 10 signs. I'm not gonna do goo just yet. We'll save that for if a probe doesn't work out and ends up stranded around the sun for some reason then we could get some science that way. 6.7 science for the temperature scan so it's not a whole lot from high over the sun. As we go around the sun our orientation with respect to the sun is going to change. Okay we are approaching the node. Now, mid-course adjustments, timing-wise, aren't that sensitive because in the grand scheme of things, if you're plus or minus a few seconds or even a few minutes, it's in the context of like a hundreds of days transfer. So percentage-wise, it's not that big a difference. This is in comparison to the situation around Kerbin, a few seconds can be a significant number of degrees or, well, significant portion of a degree around Kerbin. Your transfer stages don't need to have a thrust weight ratio of 1, but you would like to have them provide good thrust weight ratio so that you can do the burn very close to the plotted node. Because the further away from the plotted node you're trying to do the burn at, the less accurate it's going to be and the less you're going to be able to hit that particular mark. Okay. Well, that's probably the best we can do. Let's see what it actually did around Duna. It's pretty good. It's pretty good. Um, reasonable height for capture. We might want to lift the height later in order to facilitate communications. Now Ike, Duna's moon, is fairly big. And if we left the orbit like that, we would probably hit it. I don't want to hit it just yet. I want to hit it later, like when we get a contract to uh, get science from Ike, that sort of thing. So I'm going to keep the apoapsis to 1,500 kilometers, and then I'm actually going to circularize so that we can sort of do a communication satellite thing. And that's going to cost another 153 meters per second. So uh, did not cost as much as I thought um, in total. If we had brought the orbit all the way down, it probably cost a little bit more, but uh, all in all, you're talking about 600, a budget 700 for this sort of thing. And plus the whole launch, uh, well, the, the transfer burn was 1,100. So we're talking about 1,800 instead of 2,000. Okay, so now we are oriented so that the sun will go around this way. Yeah, that's right. And... Also remember, Smart ESS can be told to point uh, in a particular direction with respect to the sun, but it can't adjust that during time warp. There is a mod called Persistent Rotation that can adjust it during time warp, but we're not using that. Oh, Threads transfer window we don't need. We can see our communication system is getting a little bit stretched 30%. Where is Kerbin with respect to us right now? It's not that far actually, so it's having more trouble than I thought it would. 
That's interesting. Because um, when, when you think about how far away that is, Kerbin is at uh, 13 uh, gigameter, let's say, height above the sun. We're going to be at a roughly 21 gigameter. The gap between us is, let's say, 10. It's like it's only using this antenna and not taking these into consideration. Antenna state idle, but that's idle too. It shouldn't, I mean, the, uh, we should have a direct communication. It's a direct location there. So I don't know. So I've done something wrong. Maybe having a mix of direct and relay is not a good idea. Down to 2%. So, I've made some sort of mistake here. And here I thought I was being careful. But not so much. I mean, even if Kerbin was on the other side, the distance should be 34 gigameters. And these dishes had... Well, there were only two... Um, no, but with the DSN network, there's supposed to be... See, it's two... But that's if it's going to one of the other probes. It's uh, 10 with respect to the DSN network, so the four of them should be 40. I don't understand. Still don't get the, the communication system very well. That's, one, that's my soft spot here, see? We know we're going to probably lose communication very soon now. But there's nothing we can do, really. 1%. Is it going to hold out until we can make orbit? At least the line is going in the right direction out that way. So it's not going to be blocked by Duna. Oh, it's going to be tight. 1%. Okay. I feel like we should just start now. 1%. But no, we'll, we'll do it at the right time. Okay, about now we should start burning. So here's Duna, our first visit here. While we still have communication, let's transmit some science. Well, we certainly need communication support around Duna, but I don't know if this is good enough to provide it. Probably we need to upgrade the tracking station, let's face it. We've got flyby Duna, gather scientific data from Duna, but again we don't have the Ike contract, that's why I'm not doing that. We are not returning to Kerbin from a flyby of Duna. We'd have to get to the surface Kerbin that would requ require a heat shield. That we will do at a later time, probably in combination with another contract. Hopefully we'll get some more expo exploration contracts that will allow us to get some bonus from recovering the science around Ike and Duna and hopefully a lot of other things. Again, there's a retrograde burn, so we do it as close to Duna as we are passing. But because we're using such a small engine, it's going to be a bit off. Again, you want the high thrust weight ratio if you want to get the burns done accurately. This, it wasn't so important that we did this accurately anyway, right? It didn't matter. The difference between being a slightly askew with this was not a big deal. The important thing is that we get to orbit, and we did. Now, can we circularize? But, I mean, frankly, we can circularize... Well, we've lost probe control. Yeah, it's not that big a deal. We've recharged. Oh, we still... We got communication back. Good. Maybe it was just doing a blocking our way. Prograde. Now Duna looks a bit more distant. And we finish this up. 
I wonder if that was low over Duna and this is high over Duna. Let me check. Well, we get some more points, so I'll transmit it. So we're barely in communication, but it worked. So I still have to figure the details out. But you saw how small a rocket we used to get a probe over to Duna. So it's really not that much more difficult than getting to the moon or Mimus. It's just a matter of timing. So here we are in the orbit that I wanted. And that'll do it for this episode. I think I've covered a, a very important part of Kerbal Space Program. And if you have any questions, please do ask. And with that, I'll say thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did enjoy this video, please do press like. If you have any comments or suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below. And I'll see you next time.